Just for 1310 on my SATs. Um, <laughs> I did score perfect verbal though, uh, which meant I went to hippie school. Uh, I went to Goddard College, uh, home of the Moonbats. Um, we had an ultimate frisbee team. Uh, their name they were, they were the Visigoths. Our colors were black on black. Uh, very appropriate for sort of the, uh, the tenor of the school. The, the school that we played against was the local military college. They, they couldn't party on their, their campus, but they could go to the hippie school and party on our campus. We had all the best drugs. <laughs> um, but uh, I did go to Goddard, um, which is an interesting school if you don't know about it. Some people do. Um, it's in Plainfield, Vermont, which is kind of nearby here. Uh, almost an easy drive. Um, but it's a Dewey school. Uh, it's based on uh, principles of democratic education. What does that mean? Well, one of the primary, primary ideals of it is that students direct their own knowledge, direct their own education. And so you get to do things like, say, a student, a friend of mine, for example, has five college credit hours in philosophy of Star Trek. Um, I have five credit hours in crossing the road. Uh, there's a joke that said, why did the guy just cross the road? The answer is to get credit. And so I said, that's a funny joke. I'm going to do a class about that. So it transformed this entire like, semester-long study into, like, what does the road mean? What is its place in American society and philosophy and writing and culture? Um, because one of Goddard's values is that we challenge ourselves each other to embrace uncertainty, to experiment, and to imagine unexpected outcomes. And it taught me that I can learn anything as long as I can find someone with more wisdom and more smarts and a better SAT score than me. And I can pick up some books and do it. And that means that I have a fortunate addiction. It means I have a lot of hobbies. Um, I went to cooking school for three whole weeks before I decided I didn't want to be yelled at for in the morning. I took a year off from developing because I said, man, this is a, this is a great game. I'm going to go be a professional gambler. I'm a, a self-presenting glass artist, which means I don't get paid at all for anything I do on Etsy. I hiked the Appalachian Trail for six months. I apprenticed in a Marriott puppeteer company. Um, and I published two role-playing games. That's pretty cool. Right now I'm into yo-yos. Um, I always have a yo-yo in my hand these days, and it's not because like, I'm any good at it, but I'm just trying to get uh, to a place of it being natural. The same way that you might use, you might use an editor for everything, writing email and code and to-do lists because you want to learn that editor inside and out. I'm walking around everywhere with a yo-yo these days because I want that yo-yo to feel natural in my hands and for tricks to be just part of what I do. And it means that I'm constantly looking like an idiot on the street. I don't know, has anyone ever played with yo-yo? Anyone ever like done more than just like drop it down, pull it back? Okay, one person might have been um, Well, the problem is you look like kind of like an idiot, right? Because it comes up and smacks you in the face. So that's what you're afraid of. So like it comes back and you're like, ah! Like I flinch away from it all the time. Or I'm like doing loops and such, and I'm like unwinds, and then I have to like... <laughs> Um, and so I have to be really comfortable with kind of looking like an idiot a lot. And it's that sort of same approach that I have with code, where I don't know what I'm doing, but I have a book, and I have a teacher, so I can go learn these things. Right now, thanks to my dad, um, I'm a with the scooters. Uh, this is my uh, first scooter. Uh, this is a 1979 Vespa um, that I got off of uh, Craigslist for a thousand bucks. This is the one I ride right now. It's a 2005 Stella. It's a two-stroke engine. It's a beautiful piece of uh, Indian um, engineering. They're all made in India, and they ship them over here, and they assemble them in Chicago, so it's made in America. But it's a beautiful, beautiful machine, uh, from basically from the 70s. It's a re reproduction of these Italian scooters. Um, and I have done almost every piece of work you can imagine to it, except change my own brakes, because that's scary. Safety equipment, I might die. But um, I got into these scooters, which are a great way to get around when you don't have to deal with snow at all. Um, because 
this, but I was talking to my dad. My dad is a motorcycle guy. <coughs> um, he loves motorcycles. Right now, he's actually at some like, motorcycle rally somewhere. That's why I get to not go home this weekend, because my dad's out on his motorcycle. Um, and I said, man, I'm loving this computer thing, but I just I want to do something physical again. Right? Like, I worked with glass, and I was a stagehand. Uh, I was cooking. Like, I, those are physical things, right? Develop something. And it came out the other side. He said, why don't you get into, why don't you get yourself a motorcycle? I'm like, well, I'm scared of motorcycles. He's like, well, get yourself a scooter then. So I did. Um, and getting an older machine like this means that I have to like constantly do all this maintenance to it because it's falling apart. Like it's not just like, there's like this fun thing of like going to rallies and like getting the source parts and look at like old obscure manuals that really appeals to like the software engineering, right? It's a piece of machinery, it's a system that I can pull apart and make rational assumptions about and have it not really quite work that way. But it's good to work with my hands continually. And one time it wouldn't, it wouldn't start. As is often the story with these old machines, it just wouldn't start. I was telling my dad. My dad said, You have to remember there's really only four things that an engine needs it needs air and fuel, it needs a spark to ignite that air and fuel, and then it needs compression. It needs a way to contain that explosion so that the engine can drive itself. And what my dad was describing was a really simple search tree, right? So if the, if the engine doesn't start, I can look at it and I can say, well, is it getting fuel? Is it getting air? Is it getting electricity to make the spark? Is there a compression to capture that energy that's being generated? And then based on one of those four things not happening, I go down this search tree of similarly, like, almost binary, yes, no. Does it have gas? Does it have the right kind of gas? Okay, well, is the gas line blocked? All of these sorts of things. And this sort of approach helps me to not assume obvious problems that are coming up with my rule. About a, uh, a year ago, I got this new, this new scooter, and the first thing I did was change the fuel injection uh, tubes, because the ones that come on it are really, they're not that great. They're not that powerful. I'm like, well, a little bit of, of power. So I switched them out for new ones. Cleaned them all out, sprayed them down with like a special like fluid that comes in a very expensive can. Put it back in, hopped on, it starts right up, and I ride down the street. And in between two gas stations, halfway in between them exactly, it just stops. It stops dead. And gas station is great because you can like wheel it over, you know, and like no one thinks twice about you being there. But if like you're in like the parking lot of Starbucks, like working nearby your your bike, it's you know. So anyway, like I immediately assumed. I had screwed something up. I had mean, put the, the pins back in wrong. Or it hadn't been, oh my god, I've got this fuel cleaning spray can stuff into the gas line, and now it's like, it's exploded. Because one time, I, I took my engine apart, and I could screw the, um, the spark plug all the way back in, and the force of the engine, that compression, actually popped the spark plug out and drove it through the cowl of the engine. Like, that was exciting. <laughs> but in this case, it just turned out that I was actually just out of gas. And it took me 25 minutes to figure that out. <laughs> I should have followed the scientific method. Does anybody remember what the first, what the principles of the scientific method are? Yeah, yeah. You ask a question, you do some background research into that, sort of identify what this problem is, construct your hypothesis, you test that hypothesis, you create an experiment. How can I tell that this thing that I think is going wrong is actually going wrong? I analyze the results of that, and then I find out I communicate my results. I get published. Now, there is actually a hidden step in here that most scientists won't tell you about, which is you can change your results to match your funding hypothesis. <laughs> get funding, it's got to be in there somewhere. But the point of the scientific hypothesis, right, is that the method is to make sure that nature hasn't misled us, that we're, we're not too smart. Um, we're not as smart as we think we are. And as we get further afield of more and more esoteric concepts and ideas and projects and problems, it becomes less and less obvious when we're right. 
we have to infer that we're correct. We have to do machine learning to say, yes, we have in fact seen a 0.2% lift in sales this month, and it wasn't just, you know, that it was related to changing the color of the buy button. Until I looked at Amazon for a while. It's just asking these sorts of questions to define what it is that we know and what we don't know. If we are asking questions that we already have the answer to, then we're asking a really boring question. We have to be always asking these sorts of questions that are pushing ourselves to the limits of what we think that we know in order to increase our understanding and to level up to understand the experience that we're having. to ultimately understand that when we're trying to diagnose a problem, when we're trying to be rational about a piece of software, we are the most complicated piece of that system. There's no piece of software on the planet that doesn't ultimately have a human somewhere in its, in its loop. The software is there to serve us. It's there to solve a need that we have, to fulfill a need or solve a problem. Even stuff that's sending people to the moon, like what program talks to the program talks to the program. Somewhere in there, there's a human, and a human is punching in a number, or is following a process to enter a car or something, and that we're the ones that have that potential for disaster. So we have to understand our own interactions, our own abilities, and why we make these sorts of mistakes. Because I went to a baby school, I think a lot about learning and like how I approach learning and understanding things. Um, I'm trying to teach myself Go right now. And I've been a Ruby developer for like five or six years. Before that, I was a Perl hacker. And before that, and before that, um, because I remember the 70s. Um, I've been doing it, this for a long time. And you would think that this being like my sixth or seventh language that I've had to pick up, I would understand that I'm going to feel kind of bad that things aren't going to go quite the way I think, that I'm going to write some very bad, obvious, stupid code for a long time. And because this language is not the language that I'm used to. My Go looks like Ruby. And all the Go developers that I work with are like, yeah, OK, that works. Your test pass, it compiles, that is nice. But have you looked at this library? Have you looked at this thing you never knew about before? OK, well, I guess I should have known about that before, right? Well, that will come in time. Right? Eventually, I will figure these sorts of things out, and I'll gain that knowledge, that confidence to understand, and I'll get out of that zone, that sort of valley of desperation where I don't really know what I'm doing, where I'm the idiot who's hitting herself in the face with the yo-yo day after day. And that sort of new normalcy will set in. I'll have new level of expectations. The problem is that I do have expectations, right? I expect myself to be able to perform at a certain level. I, when I'm below that level, I'm stressed. You know, yearly reviews are coming up. Ah, I'm not committing as much as I should, or my commits are broken, or my commits are getting a lot of, a lot of code review that's getting that's kind of basic stuff, kind of one-on-one -on -one stuff. But then I get stressed about that. If I don't know how long that period of chaos is going to last, I have no idea how long it's going to take me to come out of that place of not knowing what I'm going to do. I'm doing. I've been doing Ruby for six years. Did I say five? Did I say six? I don't know. But if I don't know how long it's going to take me to get to that level of confidence and expertise, then how can I know that I'm going to come out of this on the other side? How do I know that this is a language that I can master, except for my own sense of self, my own confidence, that I'm good enough, that I'm smart enough, and gosh darn it, most people like me. I'm pretty approachable. I mentioned that I took a year off from poker. And by the way, the slides don't even really matter. I'm just advancing it so I can have my notes. I took a year off from developing to become a poker player. And the way that I became a poker player was I played a lot of poker. And I talked to a lot of friends that played poker. I read a lot of message boards about poker. I watched a lot of poker videos. And I read a lot of poker books. And one of my favorite books is by this guy named Mike Caro. Mike Caro likes to name things after himself. Um, you'll 
find that out immediately if you're looking at him at all. And uh, one of the books that he wrote, it's, it's relatively famous in the poker world, is Mike Caro's Big Book of Poker Tells. Um, and it's got Mike Caro's like cartoonish face on it, and like on every page is little cartoons of Mike Caro like giving you little lessons. And he had this, this concept that he calls the Caro's Threshold of Misery. And he names these after himself. Anyway, here's how it goes. If you're a poker player or gambler of some sort, and you can envision yourself comfortably losing $1,500 in a given game. <coughs> now, I don't know that all of you would be comfortable losing that much money. I'm not comfortable losing that much money. Let's say that you are. But that's just the level where you would start to actually feel some pain about losing a series of bets or gambles. And so if you find yourself down $500, then $1,100, and then before you even notice it, you've gone past this $1,500 threshold, you've lost $1,800. Now this is a dangerous sort of territory for people, psychologically. You're past your, your, your threshold of comfort. You continue playing, and it gets worse and worse. Hours later, you found out that you've lost $4,500, three times what you're, you think that you're comfortable losing. Your mind becomes numb. And most people at this point can't mentally comprehend what's happening to them. They move past the point of pain to a point of misery. This point of misery is the point when mental and emotional pain is maximized and nothing further will register. This is a defensive mechanism that our own brains do. We begin to abstract away our problems. We do this in our own lives, not just with gamblers. But everyday people, I wager most of you have probably woken up two hours late and written off your entire day before, or decided, well, it's already 1 a.m., and I know I have the 8 a.m. meeting, but I'll just stay down. I've already had three drinks, and I'm going to take a taxi home anyway, so shots. I should refactor this massive new belt block. But the code is so shitty anyway. Man. You know what? This database model is a mess. It's an absolute mess and it's huge. I should refactor this and break out and do that normalization thing. But I'm just going to add a column. <laughs> you know, the home page is already 4, but 4 meg. What's another JavaScript one? <laughs> These are really kind of unprofessional choices that we make about software frequently in the day-to-day -day work environment. And these aren't choices that we make out of malice or ignorance or even really laziness, but so much as we just probably crossed into this area of misery, this place where the decisions that we make don't matter anymore. We're not necessarily in control of our own destiny, or even if we are, what destiny are we moving towards? Does that destiny count for anything? We're close to that edge of burnout. And this is the place where, as organizations, we start to lose our best developers. When developers look around, they feel that nothing that they do matters, that their own success or failure is of little of no consequence to the business, or vice versa. The things that they're, in, they're not in control of relate directly to their own success or failure, or rewards, or punishments. You're not getting a raise this year because the sales team didn't meet their quota. Well, how can I, as a developer, do anything about that? That's not my fault. That's when people start to leave. They start to look around to solve their problems because they can't solve the problems they're dealing with. They have no fulcrum. They have no place to stand. They have no leverage. So they'll look for someplace else that they can go to to do that. So we have to be aware when we cross this threshold because even though beyond it, decisions don't seem to matter, they do still matter. And the secret is to keep performing as if you care. The simulacrum of care and passion and engagement. And remember that even if you don't actually feel the importance of the decision in the moment, it will matter to you later. There will come a time when it does matter.
be successful at poker, um, you have to do this crazy weird Jedi mind trick with yourself. You have to think that you're the absolute boss of the table, like that you're the best, and no one can beat you. Because as soon as you show any amount of fear to somebody else, like even like a little bit, like you're not going to be playing optimally against them. You play, you play scared. But at the same time, you have to do this rigorous self-examination away from the table about how can I be better. I have to do this in software. All, I feel like I do this in software all the time. I have to believe that I can write a, go, a load balancer and go, but I'm not really entirely sure that I can. How can I get there? What pieces of knowledge do I need to assemble? What sort of plan of education can I create to get myself there? Because we have too many choices. We don't. We have imperfect information about what we're attempting to do, almost always. There's no design document has ever captured everything that somebody needs to do. It's certainly never going to capture all of the inputs that users will do. I have no idea why someone will put invalid UTF-8 bytes into the name of their branch. People do it. And it breaks the world sometimes when you push code. It doesn't take that into account. But because I have to deal with this sort of uh, cloud of possibilities all the time of what my software can do, what it should do, and how it will be used, and I can't possibly know it, that's a really hard thing to grapple with as, as a human, certainly as an engineer. How can I apply rationality to something that I can't even begin to put metrics around, but I can't begin to understand the scope of a problem let alone the, 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 the tiny minutia of it. And this often happens when I'm debugging a problem because where do I start? It doesn't work. That's the thing that the user always says, right? Like, it doesn't work, make it work. Okay. And so if you have a good support team, right? Like you probably <coughs> train them to like take some screenshots and maybe like capture some data and gifts or you know get some sort of like structure around your, your, your bug reports or your Issues, you know, you ask, please list these sorts of things. What browser were you using? What time of day was it? Um, but so often when we're doing a problem, especially if we're working with VMs or servers and we're working with like perhaps on a different operating system, even, we can't actually test the precise situation. We simply don't have that capability always. And when we don't know the exact content where a piece of code emitted in the air, all the inputs can't be known. But given enough time, we can perfectly recreate the problem later. Sometimes, though, we can only diagnose these problems through the side effects that we have to deal with. That's frustrating as hell for me, because I want to be able to reach in and touch the thing and manipulate it. But no, I've got to do it like, write this thing that maybe puts it into a log file somewhere, and then I've got to deploy it, and I get to wait a week. That can be really frustrating. It can take me away from being rational about the problem or being in that moment. Of understanding my engagement with the software. How do I know I'm not fooling myself that it just magically starts working again? I don't know what fixed it. And this is a result of looking at things for what they are and not enough of what they mean. As, as, as an engineer, like it is what it is, right? A is A. Something is equal to something else. But taken together, what does that piece of software mean? What is its place in the world? What does this piece, what does this class do with the greater structure of a repository or an application? <coughs> As the complexity of our applications grow outwards from single lines of code, they become multicellular creatures in a sense. This complexity is grown to the point where we can't begin to comprehend all of the factors that are going into making something wiggle across a slide, or through a pond, or across a forested floor. This begins to expose the limits of our ability to be rational about software. We can't apply simple tools to it anymore. We can no longer say, I have a hypothesis, here's an experiment, unless we pull back to those higher levels. But what we work with in the moment is something, is something equal to something else, yes or no. We work with single lines of code when we need to be looking and clouds of code together. I don't know why I was going to say something about 
we ended up, uh, it took me about 60 hours, well, myself and another developer, 30 hours each, to track this problem down. And we figured that there were 600 domain names that were being registered at $3 for profit every year. Um, this wasn't really a great idea. So why the hell did we do it? Why? Why are you trying to do this, this thing for $3 a thing? Well, it turns out that you go back into the company's history, they were a small two or three person shop. They had a customer whose domain name expired. The customer got mad at them for some reason. So they said, no, we're never going to have a customer get mad at us for domain name failures like that. We're going to build this little system. And it worked perfectly fine for years until suddenly, it, suddenly the software was now maladapted for its environment. You know, just like the way that creatures evolve over time. And like whale, whales still have vestigial hind limbs. If you ever look at a whale skeleton, like way, way in the back, there's two little like flappy little legs, they're like a foot long. They don't do anything, you know. But whales still have them. Whales and dolphins still have little tiny bits of fur because they're mammals. And that betrays or belies their origin as land animals way back when. Similarly, creatures, until the creature is actually harmed by an adaptation, that adaptation doesn't go away, it isn't hindered in evolution. Software is the same way. We carry around all these little things, we're not going to remove it. Like, we're not going to pay to remove code. Well, actually, has anybody paid for group code professionally? Uh, I paid for it once. <laughs> once, though, right? Well, it was so horrible. I didn't want to accept another project from that dude because he actually, for his own negligence, let malware and SQL injections get injected into, into, somebody, into a client's website. And I just thought it was so horrible. Wow. That, yeah, I just, I kind of got an attitude. <laughs> that's a bad comment. <laughs> no, I mean, I felt bad for the client because the client had no idea that this was what was going on. But I had I had to go in there and convince this this person who had, you know, who had, had put together this project. This wasn't a, a professional developer. This was somebody who we call a cowboy who really isn't a professional developer, he's not, you know, like many of the people sitting in this room, just somebody who thought, oh, gee, I'm going to jump on the dev bandwagon. And he sold a product to a client, didn't think about what he was doing, didn't care, gave the client a nightmare. I felt bad for the client. I think it was so often, like, Build these features, and like we approach it as some cost, right? That like, well, we had the developers build this thing, like we can't just turn it off. We've got three users who love our web-based notifications, like we can't get rid of that. Um, we just we don't we don't get rid of the code until like it's actually causing a problem or there's a negative impact. Because why would we? There's no negative impact. Um, banks still, I mean, I've seen banks still. Doing things like issuing cashier checks, although that's a very, like, very obscure sort of need for cashier checks. You know, the postal service still, still has one cent stamps. Like, why do you have one cent stamps? Like, I just, why is it just a forever stamp? I want to deal with it. So, Alan Kay talk. Alan Kay, genius early computer scientist, had this famous quote that a change of perspective is worth eight points of IQ, which I really need. I really need. To discuss the understanding of the nature of code and being able to understand why it's behaving in a surprising manner requires often that we shift our view of the code away from what, uh, away from the place that our questions have naturally been and spawned. It's no longer enough to sort of say, well, why are we? When we say, uh, we have a bug because of our fork version of Ruby is doing this weird thing. The question isn't, well, how do we fix our fourth version of Ruby? The question should be, like, why aren't we on mainline? Well, that isn't a problem. Understanding a problem that our system is trying to solve, really understanding it, what is the end goal, how is it being used, not just what did we intend for it to do, is something that mechanical engineers are taught. They're taught about the ethics of engineering, about 
how their, their devices could be used in the real world. How does something pose a danger to people? How do we make it safer? But we don't. The test panel is great, but I don't have any tests for how somebody's actually going to use my software. I love the fact that uh, JavaScript developers can use GitHub GIS as a weird cheap database because there's an API for it. It's just a bunch of text. So you can, you can use GitHub GIS as a database in a pinch. It'll get shut down in about five minutes, but you could do it. <laughs> this is this idea of like multifunctionality. I mean, we're not functionally fixed to our use cases of things. One of my favorite tools is the C-Wrench, and it, it's in every single one of my toolkits, no matter what it is, even my electrical kits, because I've used it to start cars before, by like bridging electrical gaps. I always use a C-Wrench to, uh, in the place of a fuse. Um, yeah, 100 amp service, um, which if you're an electrician, that's a lot of power. But to be fair though, it was 8.20, the show was supposed to start at 8, we couldn't find a fuse, we had to do something, and I said, effectively hold my beer um, while I jammed it into the wall. And it worked, and it was very dangerous, and you should not do that. And I think the statute of limitations are over. But in cognitive psychology, this is called functional fixedness, right? Like if I just thought, like, well, we have to go get a fuse, that's the only possible solution to this problem, instead of saying, I have something that will work for about 35 minutes before it melts. And you know, we would have been left in the dark. One of the classic examples that's taught about functional fixedness is when the Titanic hit an iceberg, there weren't enough lifeboats to go around. That's why one of the reasons why so many people passed away. Why didn't people get on the iceberg? They weren't close enough to it. We couldn't use the, the lifeboats to carry people from the boat because the boat did take a long time to sink, though. Yeah, but you know what? Um, I hate to say it, most people are not altruistic. Um, if you study and read the, the congressional testimony of what happened in the aftermath of the Titanic sinking, you know, it was utter pandemonium because there was no training for how to use, how to you know, get people in boats. And there were boats that sailed away with only 12 people in it, and they were not willing to rescue anybody else who was still in the water struggling with them. Lives, even though those 12 boat, those 12 person uh, built lifeboats had a capacity for 65. Most people, unfortunately, don't think about the welfare of others. Yeah. And they don't care. Chalk it up to lack of an I think as an example, though, it's meant as an example, I guess. But software development, we have to stand sort of cognitive barriers. We, we think about a piece of software as it only does this thing, not what could it possibly do? How could I modify it to, to do the thing that I want it to do? This frame that we bring to software Thank you. 
they, they randomly ran across, across campus, and there were people who were claiming they could feel the EM radiation from cat five cable that was in a buried pipe two feet underground. And I'm not one to necessarily say that, you know, they couldn't, but I doubt it. Show me the evidence. But what I, didn't, I didn't have that experience. I had the experience of being a performance production major, which means I stood up on ladders and changed lights for a long time and loaded trucks in the cold and loaded them back up in the cold after the show was over. And I got into development because I kind of liked what developers complained about. When you're complaining that one of the two beer taps is empty, I'm like, man, give me that. I'll trade in all of the busted knees and all of the scuffed knuckles for that. So, how do you debug? What are the tools? What are the processes? The best tool for debugging or troubleshooting anything lies inside of your own skull. Every piece of software was written by a human. It can be comprehended by humans. I'm 95% confident in everyone here is a human. <laughs> I reserve a small amount of judgment because I think I might actually be in a simulation. But I think everyone here is human, or at least reacts like a human has a mental process similar to something on the range of what humans can possibly do. There's nothing that you can't comprehend that was done by another human, because ultimately we all contain within us the same exact capacity for greatness, for tragedy, for pathos, for love, for joy, for 